Hi, thanks for joining me. Today I'm going to be proving a lemma all to do with limits and integrals. And in fact, this lemma here is going to help us solve a problem. And this problem I've actually kind of solved in another video. And in that video, I kind of stated the lemma but didn't prove it. So I'm going to be proving it in this video. If you want to check out that video where we can apply this lemma, check out the link in the description below. Anyway, what is this lemma that I'm on about? We have a function g from the reals to the reals, which is continuous and periodic, and it has period t. Then we also have a function f from 0t to the reals, which is continuous. Then the lemma says that this equation holds. The limit is n goes to infinity of the integral from 0 to t of f of x g n of x dx is going to be equal to 1 over t times the integral from 0 to t of f of x dx times the integral from 0 to t of g of x dx. Anyway, this is the lemma. Let me get stuck into a proof. Okay, so the proof to this lemma is actually quite standard. We're going to be using the standard techniques that you may have seen in an integration course. So the first thing we're going to do is introduce two functions, g1 of x and g2 of x. g1 of x is going to be the maximum of g of x at 0, and g2 of x is going to be minus the minimum of g of x and 0. And it's very clear to see that both these functions here are non-negative. Let's perhaps have a deeper look as to why. This guy here, well, it's going to be the maximum of two things, and one of them think those things is 0, so certainly it's going to be at least 0. And this guy here, uh, well, if g of x is positive, well, then the minimum of these two things here is going to be 0, so then minus 0 is just 0. And if g of x, however, is negative, then we've got something negative here, so that's going to be the minimum, so we've got a negative number here, but then we've got minus. So these both, uh, both these guys here are uh, non-negative, certainly. And in fact, we can check that g of x is just equal to g1 of x minus g2 of x. Okay, and again, that's just by splitting into cases, if g of x is positive, from this guy here, we're going to take a g of x. But if g of x is positive, this guy here is going to spit out 0, and we're just going to get g of x minus 0. So it holds when g of x is positive, and you can just check for yourself that it holds for g of x negative as well. Anyway, what we have is the integral from 0 to t of f of x gn of x dx, and we're actually taking the limit of this guy. But notice that this thing here, just by linearity, is going to be the integral from 0 to t of f of x g1 of x, or g1 of nx dx, minus the integral from 0 to t of f of x g2 of nx dx. And now for now, I'm just going to focus on g1, and we want to have a play with this integral here. So we have the integral from 0 to t of f of x g1 of nx dx. Kind of by definition, this is just the sum from i equals 1 to n, or not by definition, sorry, just by linearity of the integral, or the fact that we can kind of play about with these endpoints, this is just going to be integral from i minus 1 over n times t, all the way up to i over n times t. So just to check that this is true, when i is 1, we get 0, uh, and then up to 1 over n times t, and then when i is 2, we're going to get 1 over n times t to 2 over n times t, and so on, all the way up to n over n times t, which is just t. And then, of course, we've got this thing here, f of x g1 of nx dx. And I've run out of room now, but you can guess the next step. Hopefully, if you've seen things like this before, we're going to be using the mean value theorem. Anyway, let me bring this up to the top of the whiteboard, and we'll continue. Okay, so that we have that the integral from 0 to t of f of x g1 of nx dx is given by this sum integral here. And as I said, the next step is we want to use the mean value theorem. And now before we jump into that, just two points to make. Firstly, the reason we split g into kind of g1 and g2, or the, the linear combination of g1 and g2, is because to apply the mean value theorem, we require g1 to be non-negative. But in the statement of our lemma, we just didn't, you know, we didn't insist that g was non-negative, hence why we split it into kind of one non-negative function minus another non-negative function. Anyway, this is one point I wanted to make. A second point, uh, which I forgot to mention on the kind of previous whiteboard, was that g1 and g2 are also uh, periodic with period t as well. And that's quite straightforward to see, because if you look at g1 of x plus t, for example, that's going to be the maximum of g of x plus t, 0, and g of x plus t is just g of x, so it's going to be the maximum of g of x, 0, which is exactly g1 of x, and for something very similar for g2 of x. So both g1 and g2 have period uh, t. Anyway, let's apply the mean value theorem. So that, that says that there exists some number psi i in the interval i minus 1 over n times t, all the way up to i over n times t, such that this guy here, we can kind of, if I call this thing here i1, we can kind of write i1 
as the sum from i equals 1 to n, and we can kind of take out this f of x, but instead of f of x, it's going to be f of psi i times the integral from i minus 1 over n t to i over n t of just g1 of nx dx, like so. But now this integral here is quite nice because we can do a nice little u substitution, u equals nx, so that just gives us that du is equal to n dx. So this integral here, when x is equal to i minus 1 over n times t, the n and the n are going to cancel, so u is just going to be i minus 1 times t. And when x uh, equals i over n times t, u is going to equal it, like so. g1 of nx just becomes g1 of u, and dx just becomes du over n. So n is a constant with respect to the integral, so we can bring it out to the front like so. So i1, this guy here, is just equal to the sum from i equals 1 to n of f of psi i over n multiplied by the integral from i minus 1 to i minus 1 t times i t uh, times g1 of u du. But now, here's where we use the fact that g1 is t periodic. That means that we don't have to worry about this case of i because i minus 1 to t, i minus 1 t to i t, that's an inter interval of length t. So what we can do is just choose any interval of length t, and this integral value will remain the same. So we might as well choose one that's convenient. We're going to choose 0 up to t, like so. And now we remove the i dependence on this guy here, and this thing here is just a constant. When we evaluate it out, it doesn't depend on i, it doesn't depend on n, or anything like that. So that thing there is just a constant. And what we have here is the sum from i equals 1 to n of f of psi i over n times this integral here. And remember, we want to take the limit as n goes to infinity. So we get limit as n goes to infinity of i1, which obviously depends on n. Let me just put it in brackets. is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of this guy here multiplied by this integral here. So maybe I'll write out the integral first. So 0 to t of g1 of u du multiplied by the limit as n goes to infinity of this guy here. But this guy here is just going to be equal to 1 over t times the integral from 0 to t of f of x dx, like so. So the limit as n goes to infinity of this guy here is 1 over t times the integral from 0 to t of f of x dx. And that just kind of follows from the Riemann definition of an integral. And if you've not seen the Riemann definition of an integral before, well, hopefully you can kind of convince yourself that this is equal to that by noticing that this thing here is kind of the average value of f of x, you know, f of psi i, and we're taking 1 over n and summing it over n. So if we perhaps thought about a graph of, say, f looks something like that, what we're doing is we're taking these psi i, let's just say here, 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 for example, and then we're looking at kind of the weighted mean of them, so roughly the average, and if you think about that as like a line, that's going to be approximately the integral of f. And then again, we're taking the average kind of, uh, of f, which is where this 1 over n comes into play. Uh, hence, uh, we've got this 1 over t here, like so. So this guy here tends to this guy here as we take n to infinity. And uh, yeah, I should probably mention that you can make this argument a lot more rigorous by looking at a, a Riemann integration course. Uh, but yeah, going from here to here is certainly valid. And we get the limit as n goes to infinity of i1 of n is equal to 1 over t times the integral of f of x dx times the integral of g1 of x dx. And it's looking very similar to what we want in the lemma. But just to finish it up, let me clean up the whiteboard and we'll go through with g of 2 and then put them all together. Okay, so we had that i1 tends to this guy here, so I've put an arrow here now instead of an equals. So as n tends to infinity, this integral here tends to this value here. And we get the exact same argument when we look at g2. So we have the integral from 0 to t of f of x, g2 of nx, dx. This guy tends to 1 over t times the integral from 0 to t of f of x dx times the integral from 0 to t of g2 of x dx. And again, that's because g2 is a non-negative function, so we can apply the mean value theorem and kind of proceed with the same argument. g2 is uh, t pi t periodic. So yeah, the exact same argument holds. And now what we want to do is remember, look at the integral from 0 to t of f of x times g n of x dx. So the integral from 0 to t of f of x g n of x dx. And now we're just going to use some algebra of limits. This guy here is going to be equal to, I'm going to kind of go shorthand now, is the integral of f of x g 1 minus g2 of nx dx, and just by algebra of limit, or using the linearity of the integral, I guess, this is equal to the integral from 0 to t of f of x g1 of nx dx minus the integral from 0 to t of f of x g2 of nx 
dx. And this guy here, by algebra of limits, is going to converge to this guy minus this guy, which is going to be this guy minus this guy, which is going to be equal to 1 over t times the integral from 0 to t of f multiplied by the integral from 0 to t of g1 minus g2. Okay, uh, so I've just essentially factored out the 1 over t f uh, integral of f, and then I've got g1 minus g2 left, which is what's there. But g1 minus g2 we know is precisely g. So we get that this thing here is equal to the integral from what's t of g. And that's exactly what we wanted. This guy here is equal to something minus something minus equal something minus something, which tends to the thing we want it to be. 1 over t times the integral from what's t of f of x dx times the integral from what's t of g of x dx. And that solves our problem. That proves a lemma, and as I say, it was a relatively standard argument if you've seen it before. The mean value theorem always pops up in these kind of things, and always we generally, at the start, will write our function as something non-negative minus something non-negative, uh, just so we avoid any issues with using things like the mean value theorem. Anyway, I hope you have enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one. Have a great day.